row, where it begins and where it always ends. The sun that had flamed into dusk over the Limpopo rose again behind London's soft drizzle. A night away, but a world apart. My Africa was suddenly just memories. It might have been a dream. La Gushoni Langa Zakubuin Komo Peshea Kolwanje La Gushoni Langa Lagushoni langa Zakubui ngomo Peshe ya kolwante Lagushoni langa On May the 24th this year, I was expelled from South Africa. For nearly four years, I'd been the BBC's correspondent in Johannesburg, living there with my family, reporting on that country as it went through one of the bloodiest convulsions in recent times. Reporters like me have a privileged life, really what amounts to a reserved seat in the front row of history. I was invited to the dinner tables of white cabinet ministers, who I'm not ashamed to say I liked and to the funeral meals of young blacks who'd been killed by their police. I was gassed, shot at, beaten, censored and reviled. But most nights, I have to admit, I went home to the compromising comforts of white South Africa. I can't go back now, but I can try to recreate for you something of what it was like to be there. We've drawn on four years of filming, some of which we couldn't show before. We've gone back to people who helped me understand a little of what South Africa really means. What we have is not a survey, nor an analysis, and hopefully not a judgment. That isn't a reporter's job. In any case, though I can reach my own private conclusions on the central moral issue of racial discrimination, I have much more difficulty with complex questions of good and evil, power and survival. A personal journey back then to four years of my life that were dominated by one word. Apartheid was already a dirty word there when I arrived. It was the force behind the flood of blacks that washed into town every day that banished them to satellite ghettos at night. But officially, it was dead. For me, apartheid was a word written in emptiness. My town was one of the world's great cities, but how desolate it felt after the working day. Even the restaurants closed early so their black waiters could catch the last train to Soweto. To stay the night in space reserved for whites was a crime. How pleasant that space felt in the crisp Transvaal dawn. Room for my family to breathe and spread themselves there. Just five minutes easy drive from the city's center. We were an ordinary family made privileged by apartheid. White and so qualified to live convenient lives that elsewhere are the prerogative of the rich. You're listening to Radio Today on Radio South Africa. The time is 8 In winter, we'd sometimes catch a whiff of Soweto's smog drifting across the broad lawns of our street. Most of our neighbours had never been there. They said the blacks were happy, but built high walls and talked of Australia. Ten minutes away was a much more foreign land. Over the main road, past the police station, through the roadblock, the black ghetto of Alexandra. I'd bring visitors here, knowing the contrast would take their breath away, as it had mine when I first came here. <laughs> to those blacks, our maid led an enviable life, snug in a white family's house. The law allowed her to live with us, 
but not her children who had to stay in a homeland far away. She shared our lives, but remained a cheerful stranger, insisting on calling us Master and the Madam. Don't call me that, I used to say. No, Master, she always replied. Our white suburbs were dedicated to the pursuit of graciousness. When our blacks were hungry, we didn't tell them to eat cake, we ate it ourselves. This banquet in aid of the starving was held with the country in a state of emergency, the townships in flames, and drought searing the black homelands. But there were more important things to talk about. <laughs> and what are we going to wear? We've got the total lines. <laughs> they saw nothing at all insensitive about this glittering occasion. On the contrary, I was urged to report it as positive news for a change. It was a lulling, cosy world, half hidden in hypocrisy, yet visible through our children. The adults were polite to us, but their sons bullied mine. Your dad, they said, tells lies about South Africa. Their school was an imitation English prep school. Before, of course, Britain went to pot. It wasn't a bad school, but it was narrow. Discipline came before discussion, manners before morals. It had defied the government and taken in a handful of rich Indians and a black. A small act of bravery that spread a glow of liberalism through the parents, but little insight to the children. And they reflected their parents' real views, free of evasions. They appeared incapable of imagining a world where blacks were their equals. In the townships, I saw their contemporaries leading much narrower lives. <laughs> Confined to the impoverished and violent townships, the third world down the road. If the only blacks Simon and Roland knew were servants, the only whites these kids normally saw were policemen. Inevitably, when the trouble came, the enemy. I met black kids my son's age who saw themselves as soldiers in a revolutionary war. It uh, depends on the government. If they want to start the war, then they get a war. But what does the bitter end mean for you? Death, maybe. FIFA Mandela, FIFA! My boys learned Latin. Black children were learning the rhetoric of revolution. Viva Mkonda, Viva! Our neighborhood was easily alarmed. That fear of black violation, of black revenge on our families, was never far from the surface. That these people enjoyed one of the highest standards of living on earth seemed to me no compensation. Rumors would spread that next Monday, the blacks would come for our children. The police turned out in force, the schools laid on extra protection, many white kids were kept at home. Nothing happened. Everywhere we went, whites were afraid. In the Transvaal, the white Afrikaners that have voted Mr. Boerta's National Party into power for 40 years are worried now. Black violence, international isolation, the reforms that have nibbled away at the institutionalized superiority of their race have made many yearn for the old certainties of apartheid. Alexandra may be quiet now, but this week's trouble, so close, has made Johannesburg's whites nervous. Security firms have been doing record business from white families, some of whom could hear the gunfire and now feel black anger is a real threat. Um, well, I've decided to put barbed wire down here and get a small gun. When I speak to my friends, they live in Fort, like little Fort Knoxes. And how do you think the situation is possibly going to progress in the next couple of months? I don't know. I've got a very good feeling. I think everything's going to come right. 
the big companies aren't taking chances. There's been a rush to arm and train their security guards. The pump action shotgun is a favorite weapon. It's harder to obtain than a handgun, but reckoned to be more effective. Pets were often trained to go for blacks. In one chilling incident near us, dogs killed a maid. The owners were soon swamped with offers to buy such good guard dogs. It was a terribly violent country. Brutal undercurrents flowed through the cultures of both races. It wasn't just apartheid that brought them to the surface. In Soweto, 25 domestic murders a weekend were routine. Most whites seem to have guns and few inhibitions about using them. But as that endemic violence burst out into what began to look like the first splutterings of revolution, my problems as a reporter got worse. The first was plain survival in what amounted to no man's land. Reporters, and really much more so the camera crews, were constantly harassed and even shot at by the police, yet treated with suspicion by the township blacks, who would on occasion threaten to burn us to death. The second problem was ethical. For all its self-justifications, television news has a constant appetite for violence, accessible violence. Were we risking our lives to report significant news, or to provide a little vicarious excitement on a dull news day? The third problem was political. The pictures were tearing South Africa's image to shreds. Pretoria was determined to stop them. You people, let's get out now very quickly, okay? okay. Because you people are the fucking cause of this now. Yeah, all right. So get out. Okay. Uh, you're not the cause. Of it. Don't, don't come and talk shit to me now. Just get out of this fucking place, quick. Yeah, okay, we go. All right, take it easy. You're sick and tired of this fucking business, man. So just get in your, your vehicles and out of Soweto. I'm giving, I'm giving you half an hour to get out of Soweto. We were arrested. There appeared no legal reason. We were eventually released. An appropriate way to end a year reporting South Africa. But while the churchmen were waiting for another chance to enter the township, the police decided to act against reporters and cameramen. We were arrested and taken under armed guard to two police stations. There we were searched, notebooks were examined and videotapes confiscated. We were held for two hours while lawyers contested the legal basis for our continued detention. Eventually we were released without charge, but with the police still maintaining that attempting to cover a group of churchmen trying to bring peace to a troubled area was, in South Africa, breaking the law. Freedom of the press and of action. Yes, freedom. Yes, freedom of the press, and the press knows that I stand for freedom of the press. But what I don't stand for, I stand for a responsible press. By taking photographs and taking television films, which they sent overseas to besmirch the name of South Africa, that is not freedom of the press. The children had begun attacking the police armoured vehicles. Tear gas and rubber bullets would disperse them for a while, but could not stamp out the rioting, which merely flared up elsewhere. When two of my friends, who'd spent weeks filming in the Cape Townships for CBS News, chanced on a massacre, it proved to be the last straw. The police decided to hit back hard. They sent in an unmarked lorry, only the SAS on the number plate showing it was a railway's police vehicle. It carried anonymous wooden boxes and at first was not attacked. The trouble continued though, and the lorry was ordered to make another run. This time, the crowd started to stone it. At least three coloured youths were killed outright before they could take cover. 
this demonstration at the university new emergency laws made reporting protest and certainly the police response to it punishable by up to 10 years jail the courts overturned those laws but the government was past caring when we filmed this next sequence of police brutality i was expelled We became targets of a police force that was overstretched, frustrated and often out of control. One day I was calling London from the front room of a friendly coloured family down the road from what had become a routine confrontation. A policeman ran up and fired a tear gas canister straight through the plate glass window at me. It burst right at my feet and in that confined space it was absolutely devastating. All I could do was throw up all over the carpet. That sort of thing happened often, but on the whole I was lucky. One of my friends, a vital and brave cameraman, was butchered to death and several others were injured. I've seen a lot of violence. I don't find it exciting. It makes me feel sick, it makes me feel empty and dispirited. As a young reporter, cultivating cynicism as a substitute for experience, I imagined that violence and human misery were things you became hardened to but it actually upsets me much more now than it used to. It disturbs me that violence is often glamorized in television fiction and made to appear free from consequences. But I find the way that we tidy up real violence, the way we sanitize it on the news, very worrying too. I can understand why, but it is a violent world. And to understand it, just occasionally grown up people lucky enough to live sheltered lives should have an opportunity to appreciate what it's really like. Most weekends, I went to the funerals. But none so menacing as the day they buried the radical chief Maisa. The knives were out for his killers, a black gang which normally seemed to have police protection, but not that day. I followed the mob as it chased one of the gang home. His family wouldn't let him in, but the mob wanted them too. They caught him. You can look away, I couldn't. A single blow rarely kills, but death is sudden. One minute I was watching a terrified boy, the next a carcass. We knew to interfere would mean death, yet standing there witnessing them kill was perfectly safe. I knew the moment he died. I felt the spirit dissolve from his body. It wasn't just murder, it was revenge, the most depressing thing I've ever seen. More than violent death, the evil soul of man. It's not just difficult to forget, it's impossible, endlessly being replayed in the camera of the mind. It was not an experience I could share, the fleeting impression I put in that night's report was stripped out. After much heart searching, we tidied up the truth and went back to reporting only what was considered fit to show. That itself was full of the primal passions of man. The urge to survive drove white Afrikaners back to the simplicities of their past, to gather under the dark emblem of the Afrikaner Fierstansbewerking, the R via Beer. To me, their leader, Eugène Terreblanche, seemed to radiate a kind of satanic magnetism. Maybe it wasn't quite sane, but neither was Nazism. 
my comparisons made Terre Blanche angry. Why must I change the emblem? Which is not the same as the swastika. This is the three sevens. Three sevens designed by people who believe in the Bible. The holy sevens. Why don't you ask me about the three sixes? The six, 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 the sign of the beast. But yet, you want to question the sevens. No, sir, I am not a Nazi. I am a Christian Afrikaner who believes in the right, that I have the right, like any people, a people of the world, to be myself. I am not a Nazi and I don't want to be Adolf Hitler or anybody else. I just want to be myself. I'm just a simple man who like my land, my people, and my country, my language, which unluckily I cannot speak today because you prefer that I speak in a foreign language. Thank you, sir. He fixed you in the focus of his pale blue eyes and his rhetoric unrolled like thunder. Do not that same clearling problem what there is 600 landers to strike as the clearling of four, five mal more as the blankers and the cap. Now we'll be a bit of a and now here is the clearling problem of the scores from the... You didn't need to understand, to feel his power. Vat jou kleerlinge weg uit die vrystaat in die Transvaal en regeer met hulle daar. He was the dark messiah of the white folk, but this was a land of messiahs. Each people had a cause, each cause a rhetoric, each rhetoric a voice to move men's souls. Such was Dr. Alan Boussac. He may have had his flaws, but he spoke with the rhythm of hymns. We see the tears on the cheeks of those who have buried loved ones who have died in the struggle. And we share their grief. And we know the price is high, but the end is near. We see at this moment justice still stumbling on the streets of South Africa. And apartheid still reigning supreme on the throne of this land. And the price is high, but the end is near. We hear the voices of the beast as it shouts at us, as it tries to frighten us, as it tries to intimidate us. And we know the price is high, but the end is near. We know, we know that we will have to pay, and it is costly. And the struggle is long and hard, and the road is arduous. The price is high, but the end is near. Do not despair. Do not look around. Do not betray our faith. Do not betray our children. Do not betray our fathers. Do not betray our mothers. Do not betray our vision. Do not betray the justice we are fighting for. Do not betray the land. We will see that will rise up out of the ashes of this country as apartheid will crumble to dust. The price will be high, but the end is near. Hear me? Lachranji, hear me, P.W. Buta. Hear me also, O oh my people. Leave this church today strengthened and strong and faithful and clear in your own mind. The price is high, but the end is near. I was given 10 days to leave the country. The price for South Africa had indeed been high, but the end didn't seem any nearer. Thousands had died or been imprisoned without trial. Reform had been replaced by repression. Hope had turned to fear. But it wasn't over. The young black comrades have a slogan to dismiss every setback, every brutality a misquotation from their jailed leader, Nelson Mandela. 
there is, they say, no easy road to freedom. In the end, I left South Africa feeling pretty depressed. I'd met and known brave people of goodwill on all sides, but it seemed to me they were greatly outnumbered by others. Whites who were shallow and selfish, willfully blind to the realities of their country and obsessed with the preservation of their privileges. Blacks who'd allowed their cause to peter out in fractious brutality. Perhaps. But either way, there's much bitterness there now and the chances of South Africans peacefully resolving their problems seem to me to be less than they were when I went out there four years ago. I also felt depressed as a reporter because in many ways I think we failed to put across what South Africa was really like and all too often served only to reinforce the prejudices and preconceptions of people back home. In the struggle to cover the news, perhaps we missed the story, the essence of it anyway, the emotional distance between the races that dictated South Africa's past and will determine its future. Just occasionally we did manage to reach that central truth. For me, near the end of my assignment, through a black man who died before I met him. Katiti Sambo was killed in the Kinross mine disaster, and we followed him on his last journey home. The miners who survived wait for the bodies of those who didn't. Number 10329, Sambo. Katiti Sambo, a number now amongst so many dead. That number chalked on his coffin, piled with others in the mortuary vans. There on the street, white officials hurriedly open all the coffins so their friends can make sure the number and the face match. Is he? Yeah. Who is that? Yeah. It's your brother. Yeah. Katiti Sambo's two cousins who survived the poison fumes underground wait to take him in one of the dozens of vans back to their home. Returning to the homeland village, all three had left as migrant labourers six months ago. It's night when they get to Kamklushwa in the highlands of Kangwane, a remote, close-knit community that's been preparing to mourn its dead since the men from the mine recruiting office brought news of the Kinross disaster. In the hut specially prepared, the village mounts a vigil that lasts all night. This was Katiti Sambo's home before he left his wife and this traditional African community to live in a compound in the white man's mines. Death at 25 has returned him to those traditions. In the morning they slaughter the bull for the funeral feast. The village women prepare their great pots of mealy porridge. And as the morning stretches on, Katiti Sambo's widow is brought from her vigil to the African burial service. They've come from miles around to hear his friend who was there in the Kinross Stopes tell how he died and talk of the Swazi paradise he's gone to. There are few young men in Kamklushwa. Most go as migrant laborers and they're not allowed to take their families with them. They come home once a year. Their babies are born before their next leave. They buried him in the early afternoon in the graveyard outside his village. His friends will go back to the mines. His family will be paid some compensation. He died as migrant miner 110329, but was buried Simeon Katisi Sambo, son of Kamklushwa. This is Michael Burke for the 6 o'clock news in South Africa. Michael Burke is now based at BBC London, where he reads the news.